So I think uh, Maria has a presentation uh, that we're going to go through uh, for a couple minutes, and then um, we'll have a conversation, and you guys will join in. And I just want to add to Ben's comments. Um, it's a particular delight for me to get to meet Maria in person today and uh, be part of this conversation. Uh, as you hopefully know, Maria was one of the people that we featured in time uh, for our person of the year uh, last year in a package called The Guardians, uh, where the focus was on journalists who are under attack uh, for their work uh, throughout the world and, and you know, with some pretty important implications. Uh, for democracy. So uh, after staring at Maria on a lot of page proofs uh, and reading her, her poor guy, <laughs> page proofs, uh, it is a delight to get to meet her in person. So um, you want to go through your presentation? Sure, sure. First of all, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And Ben has been fantastic to really like shepherd me through campus. First of all, you know, for me, I graduated class of 86 and walking through campus that doesn't change, it's very strange. Uh, I feel like I'm remembering what it was like to be a student. So I was walking in the past and yet I'm in the present and I'm trying to think about the future. So it's these rare moments that I love. I'm going to just quickly go over what we're dealing with in the Philippines and why is it important to you? because we're a little bit like the canary in the coal mine. Uh, what's happening to us is happening to the United States. An easy one is Cambridge Analytica, the most compromised accounts in, the, in that scandal happened, were here in the United States, right? But the country with the second largest number of compromised accounts was the Philippines. In the Philippines, uh, we spend globally the most amount on, of time on the internet and the most amount of time on social media. 97% of Filipinos on the internet are on social media, are on Facebook. So Facebook is our internet. So that's kind of, we're a Petri dish essentially. Uh, and that's part of the reason I set up Rappler in the Philippines. So let me quickly go through, sorry, one more time. Um, this is 1980, the end, of the, the end of last year when the ball dropped in 2018. And Edward was there. It was kind of the United States saying, let's bring all the journalists from CNN to Fox, all of the different places. Uh, let's bring them together for a ball drop to welcome in 2019. And then I was lucky enough to be the sole representative for the rest of the international community. <laughs> I asked that. I was like, me? <laughs> anyway, so this is the video that ended 2018 and began 2019, but it backtracks over time into the one year where uh, in 14 months, beginning January 2018, Rappler was hit with 11 cases. I'll tell you more about it later. So here's, here's what 2018, 2019, how it began and what 2018 was like. It's three minutes long. Commission has ordered the closure. The Securities and Exchange Commission orders the revocation of our certificate of incorporation of online news site map Raptor. We felt that going to get PDRs, which don't get any ownership or any control, would give us the ultimate independence. Raptor, try to pierce the identity. And the U.S. Bank of American Ownership. DIA funded, you know, no, uh, no, 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 no.
It will be bloody, he warned. The funeral parlors will be packed. He has kept his promise. Thousands have been killed, many among them <coughs> poorest in society. <laughs> A week after Trump called CNN and, and the New York Times fake news. A principled resistance to the erosion of democratic norms. They have also shown how a newsroom led and staffed by women can stand up to a misogynist president. You know, this is the time to fight. This is the time to tell people, here, here's the line. And you have to make sure that our government doesn't cross it, because when it does, we're no longer a democracy. We at Rapper decided that when we look back at this moment a decade from now, we will have done everything we could. We did not duck. We did not hide. We are Rapper, and we will hold the line. So, what are we facing? Well, like your world, this is a, a quote I gave to Al Jazeera. Uh, what's happening in the world today? If you can make people believe lies are the facts, then you can control them. How do you know what truth is? This is the battle for truth. It is the battle of your generation, mine as well. This is a book by Tim Snyder on tyranny, right? And he kind of took it apart in just these four ways. I talked about this at The Prince last night. Step one, well, look at that. If you want to rip the heart out of a democracy, you go after facts. That's what modern authoritarians do. So this wave of populism, there's a reason why it's happening so much quicker now. There's a global platform, a lie seated in one, spreads. Um, step one, you lie all the time. Step two, you say it's your opponents and the journalists who lie. Step three, everyone looks around and says, what is truth? There is no truth. Guys, don't go there, because the minute we go there, it gets to number four. Resistance is impossible, and the game is over. This is an existential moment for journalism and actually pushes forward how information is power. Right? It's an existential moment, I think, for democracy. Here's what we've seen, the global phenomenon. This is uh, August of 2016. We started seeing something called patriotic trolling. This is coined by Camille Francois. She's with Graphica, if you want to look at some of this stuff. Um, we were working on a project together, uh, and it's state-sponsored online hate and harassment campaigns meant to silence and intimidate, meaning they're using freedom of speech to incite hate, pound you into silence, right? That's the technique. Women are a favorite easy target. You don't control by censorship anymore. You control by flooding, right? The difference between an Excel sheet and big data, that's what we're talking about. A lie told a million times is the truth. And these are the three steps that we've seen in the Philippines. I've felt it, but the woman who really has been serving two years in prison before her real trial began is Lila de Lima. So the first, this happened to her. First is you allege corruption. You attack the credibility of whoever the target is. Uh, you repeat this a million times. And that becomes fact. You astroturf it, right? Uh, second, particularly for women, use sexual violence. And you degrade that woman, you degrade them, you inflame biases, fuel misogyny. The minute that happens, your credibility gets shot, right? I've been called every animal you can think of. Um, every, I'll show you some of them. Anyway, we keep going. And then the third one, right before she was arrested, three weeks before Lila de Lima was arrested in, in the beginning of 2017, the propaganda machine began trending, hashtag arrest Lila de Lima. 
Uh, and when she was arrested, it was almost a foregone conclusion. It's like fertilizer for this, right? In May of 2017, that propaganda machine tried to trend hashtag arrest Maria Ressa. It didn't trend, which is probably the reason I'm still not in prison. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, but we'll talk about it later. Um, Hashtag arrest Maria Ressa, let me show you what happens, right? So this is a, a pro-government, a pro-Duterte uh, propaganda content creator. Um, we published the, the conversation between Trump and Duterte. And because we did that, he actually then wrote, Rappler just made the Philippines a legitimate target of North Korean nuclear missiles. It sounds really crazy from here, right? People believe it. From there, that hashtag, so he began the hashtag, it jumped to Twitter. Ipatawag na yan sa Senado, hashtag arrest Maria Ressa. Uh, that's a campaign account of then Mayor Duterte. From there, it jumped to an overseas account. Um, I can smell an arrest and possible closure of rapper.com. This is May 2017, okay? So you can see how it seeded. I was arrested in February 13th. It was the Valentine's Day gift for me. Um, so from there, let's go to the sexual stuff, right? It jumped here. Maybe Maria Ress's dream is to become the ultimate porn star in a gangbang scene. It's not, but you know, it's there on, on social media. And then here, this was posted on Rappler where we have almost 4 million followers. Me to the RP government, make sure Maria Ressa gets publicly raped to death when martial law expands to Luzon. We've had two extensions of martial law now in Mindanao. These two, the last two, are young men. They were graduating college. And when I posted it, the only defense that we had, that I had as a journalist, is to shine the light. When I posted that, within a day, his, the schools contacted me, right? So this kind of information operations that the government, that many authoritarian style leaders are using around the world, will leave an imprint on our values. That worries me, right? So anyway, that's part of what we're seeing is historical revisionism. Uh, the son of Ferdinand Marcos, his name is Bong Bong, ran for vice president in the 2016 elections. He created social media campaign accounts, right? They're still there and they've gained more power over time, but this is the kind of information operations they're doing. It's historical revisionism that martial law wasn't so bad. This peppers comments and look at it, right? It's essentially very, it's not trying to make you believe one thing. All it does is just like the attacks on Black Lives Matter, it shifts you slightly. So it's kind of, think about it like, I, I have two analogies. It's like death by a thousand cuts. Because every cut seems, you know, it's just a paper cut. But if it's bleeding, if you have a, a lot of these cuts, they will, they will have an impact. It's like termites on a wooden floor. And we're standing on that floor. These termites, you don't feel, you don't see, but that is the impact of information operations like this. Um, then real journalists or ex-journalists who will see the lie and people believe it because they don't know any differently. Uh, when I did uh, the series in mid-2016, I got hit with 90-90 hate messages per hour. In this one, uh, Jay Sonza is a, is a journalist, a former journalist. He's retired. The other guy is a a former journalist who became a government spokesman, a presidential spokesman. But you can see here, uh, he says, how can Ressa be a Filipino when both her parents were Indonesians? Um, it's not true, but a week late later, after he posted this, a, f a classmate from school uh, from Princeton actually called me and asked whether my parents were Indonesians, right? It travels around the world. so. It's not just fake accounts, it's real people, and you can't tell the difference. Here's the example of the attacks on traditional media. This is January 2018, two surveys released the same month. The one on top is the Pew Global Attitude Survey. They asked Filipinos, um, do you trust traditional media? 86% real people said that they trust, that they believe traditional media in the Philippines is, the quote is fair and accurate. 
But the bottom one is the Philippine Trust Index. And they asked people on social media what they thought of traditional media. It's, it's almost the opposite impact. 83% said they distrusted <coughs> traditional media. How did that happen that both of these things are true? Here, this is the data. And I'm going to show you very quickly what the data means, right? Because this is June, January 2015 to April 2017. And I just want you to look at two. These are the attacks on media that have happened since then. And you can see bayaran means corrupt, bias, bias. I always add an ED because I'm a grammar Nazi. But how many times does this happen, right? If you look at bayaran and bias, the attacks, the campaigns began here. President Duterte was elected here. And the drug war began here. The weaponization of the drug war happened, sorry, the weaponization of social media happened during when the drug war began, right? And you can see how, just like in the United States, they pound a fracture line of society. And they pound it to the point that it becomes truth, right? So this is part of what is happening beneath the surface of how traditional media is being weakened, how facts are weakened when facts or it can't be trusted, then you don't have truth. When you don't have truth, you don't have trust, right? In the United States, your institutions still work. In the Philippines, our institutions are not as credible as traditional media in the past. So this has repercussions in our society. So what did we do? We took the data. We began to look at 26 accounts that seemed to be attacking, and this was early on, like July 2016. If you questioned extrajudicial killings, like there were eight dead bodies every night. If you questioned that on Facebook, you would get slammed. Very vicious, visceral attacks. And what happened? People pulled out. People became silent, and they stopped questioning. Within six months, Filipinos were saying, it is OK to kill, right? So what we did with the data is we dumped it in a database, because I needed to help my social media team figure out how to respond. So this, these are the URLs that spread fake news, in quotes, um, meaning they're spreading disinformation, lies. Those 26 fake accounts, we actually manually counted how many they impacted. It took three months. 26 fake accounts working together as a sock puppet network could impact 3 million other accounts. That's just 26 fake accounts. In the French elections, uh, Facebook took down 30,000 fake accounts, right? So imagine the impact of that. All right, so here's where the lies spread. These are the URLs. These are the Facebook pages that actually spread these URLs. And then every time it's reposted more than 10 times, it turns red. I want to bring you to when we published the Propaganda War series. It's a three-part series that, sh that showed you how government pro-Duterte accounts were manipulating Filipinos. And that happened in early October of 2016 way before Mark Zuckerberg appeared in Congress. Look at, look at the information operations. And then I want to show you one page, Sally Matai. This page has since been deleted. But in here, you can see Sally Matai is doing a cut and paste, right? This is a full-time job. And then you can kind of see where that account, look, as many as 84. And then look at the groups where that account posts. Duterte, Marcos pages, this is where it goes viral, right? And these accounts, the campaign pages, have gained a lot of momentum in the algorithms because they've been around since the campaigns. That's the data my social media team looks at. And then they decide, are they going to block? Are they going to respond, right? When you get 98 messages per hour, it's very hard to respond to everything. You can't really deal with it all. So. You choose your battles. Let me show you, and this is the last thing I'll show you so we can, we can maybe take your questions, um, and I'd love to take your questions. <laughs> this is an attack on our vice president. Unlike the United States, our vice president comes from a different political party. If anything happens to President Duterte, she takes over. But she's also a woman. 
under incredibly intense attacks on social media. I think she, like Lila de Lima, we didn't know this was happening, right? This is what the data looks like in the attack against her in January of 2018. It's called hashtag Lenny Leaks. That's what we pulled out. This doesn't mean anything to you, right? But if we use social network analysis, it looks like this. This is the foundation of our information ecosystem in the Philippines, social media. This is an attack on Lenny Robredo, and it is so, it is so systematic that each of these three accounts take care of segments of the population. This is a pseudo-intellectual account, this one. This takes care of creating content for the middle class, and this takes care of content for the mass base. She's a former singer-dancer who helped President Duterte in the campaigns. This one, attacking Lenny, they wanted to attack her credibility among the thinking class. She created the content, was amplified by the middle class, and then boosted by the mass base account. Each one of the dots, they're Facebook pages, right? So from here, if this forms the foundation of the ecosystem, it jumps to traditional media through here. She's a columnist for the Manila Times, which is essentially, uh, <laughs> what will I say? Um, the chairman emeritus of the Manila Times is the head of international public relations for President Duterte. Right? So from there, it works hand in hand. The attacks against Lenny then worked hand in hand with state media. And it was around this time that state media said that they were working with China and Russia. And in fact, our Philippine news agency actually went to Moscow and trained with Sputnik. Isn't that nice? Uh, and then from there, we closed the loop. And in April 2017, this account, the mass base account, was actually given a formal government position. She headed social media for the, Philipp for the Philippine government. She headed social media for the presidential palace, right? She's since resigned in December of 2018 because she's now running for Congress. Um, she is, well, anyway, let's keep going. This is what our information ecosystem looks like today. After my arrest, February 13th, and you can see, and if I were to map what the United States looks like, I think the tactics are very similar, right? These are the anti, I'm calling them anti-Duterte clusters because they kicked in after I was arrested. And you can see that they share, all of these are traditional media groups in the Philippines, not politics.com, but this. Phil Starr, these are traditional media groups. They actively share the stories from there. But look at what the propaganda machine has done. Pro-Duterte, pro-Marcos clusters actually are trying, I think here, these are all, except for Manila Times, they're all created new content creators, they're in search of like an Alex Jones, right? So they no, don't share traditional media. They avoid it because what they want to do is to hijack you into an alternative space where reality is slightly different. Um, finally, what's the difference in scale? Huge. Our social media ecosystem is dominated by pro-Duterte, pro-Marcos communities. It is astroturfed, right? So is President Duterte is extremely popular, unlike Trump, 80% approval ratings, plus plus. Um, but is that real? Is it real or is it astroturf? Is it a bandwagon effect? Um, and then you can kind of see how tiny this is. And it only happens, it becomes bigger when something bad happens, unfortunately, something bad happens to me. Like when I get arrested, I don't like getting arrested. Um, but people come in and jump in and they brave the trolls. Uh, let me just, actually, let's leave it at that. Let's leave it at that. I just want to leave you with one thing. I was looking at the Ukraine. Let's look at how it connects. Information is power, remember? So on Twitter, we did this story a while ago. Uh, this account, Ivan. Ivan was tweeting exclusively about Brexit, then about US elections, then about the Catalan elections. Then when we found him, he was tweeting about the Philippines. When we posted this story, uh, Twitter took his account down 
again within 12 hours or so. But you can see it's connected to the RT Sputnik satellite accounts. This one is on Facebook. And this is, this is something that came from data that was released by the Senate Intelligence Committee last December. Um, this is the attack networks against Rappler in and around that time. This is Rappler here. These were the attack dogs. This account, dailycentry.net, has since been taken down by Facebook last January, but it's one year old and its expert is this guy, an American who's used by RT and Sputnik and it's a frequent expert for Iranian television. He's popped up as an expert in the Philippines. Facebook took this account down. Because this is what we're dealing with now, right? Combined with online and offline violence, a climate of fear. And how do we stand up? You have to start with your area of influence. Um, clean it up, right? This is, at least that's what we're asking students in the, in the Philippines to do, our communities to do. First, you know, I just, you know, having, listening to you today, I am reminded again how fortunate um, I think we all are that we have people like you willing to do this work, especially under these conditions. So if you'll forgive me, I'd like to start with a little bit of a, just a, a Princeton question maybe. And I think, sure. I think you didn't get interested in journalism until after Princeton, but could you talk a little bit about maybe what influenced you from Princeton or what what you find helpful now and then maybe for this this audience of young people uh, you know what how did you kind of get on this path and uh, I, I, I'm old enough that my kids are basically this audience's age and my friends who are journalists all say things to me like oh my kid doesn't want to become a journalist and, and, and thank God um, because of the sense maybe not even so much financially, but that it is a, a, a profession that is under uh, attack. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you took away from Princeton and then kind of also uh, what you think about getting into journalism. Uh, wow, uh, okay. Um, I was pre-med, like I was a good Asian American. Uh, I did what my mom wanted. I got it out of the way the first two years and then I did English and theater and dance. So, uh, and then I went and got a Fulbright because I wanted to go home. I wanted to figure out where home was, who was I? If you come from more than one culture, this is always a question. And I actually gave myself until I was 40 to figure out where home was going to be. But um, I fell into journalism because 1986 was the People Power Revolt. And when I landed in the Philippines, it was just an incredible time period. So imagine, I began my career, CNN came along then and said, uh, uh, you should be a reporter. I had no experience. And <laughs> I had no experience. I think, anyway, I did it. And um, it's now a backbone of my identity. Um, what can you, here's my advice for you coming out of here. You won't appreciate Princeton until you're really out, uh, especially if you have a senior thesis in, <laughs> right? Um, you don't have the carols anymore, I hear, but I lived in my carol. I wrote a, a, I wrote a, a play for my senior thesis, which was, played, which was presented on, on team, and then we took it to the Fringe Festival in Edinburgh. It was amazing, Princeton did that, right? So, uh, the, the ties, I guess the first is always make the choice to learn. What Princeton taught me was that whatever mess the world is in or whatever mess you are studying, pull a thread and pull that thread with, with great persistence till you have clarity of thought. What Princeton taught me was how to solve a problem. And that's now a phrase that te Silicon Valley uses all the time. We solve a problem. But Princeton always taught us that, right? How to think, I think, that's what we pull out of this place. And um, coming out, make the choice to learn. It's OK not to know what you're doing. I told the Princetonian last night you know, uh, that um, I had a hard time, I'm going to this is not for you. 
I had a hard time. I had a hard time committing to relationships when I was younger, um, and the, and committing to a career is just like committing to a relationship, right? And one of my friends gave me the best advice, which is, "I love you today. I promise to love you tomorrow," and that somehow the next days will become a path that will define who you are. And you're making the active choice in the moment every day. Do we, do we have some uh, people considering journalism here? Can I see some? Hands? Oh, I forgot to answer. <laughs> Yay! Right, wow. Great. So our, great. Our, our profession is being clobbered right now, right? <laughs> I mean, our business model is dead. Uh, <laughs> It's actually true, right? Uh, and time is interesting because you will see like a 116-year-old startup, essentially. Um, it's, this, it's this fusion of Salesforce buying time. Yes, it, it helps to have a billionaire. Yeah, that's, but I think you'll see something really, it's similar to what we're trying to do in Rappler, which is the fusion of tech and data and journalism. Um, if you ask me what Rappler is, uh, we build communities of action. That's the elevator pitch. Uh, and the journalism is the food that we feed our communities of action. Uh, because in the end, working 20 years for CNN, I got tired of throwing stories into a black hole and not having any impact, right? So why would you want to be a journalist today? Because, just like a Princetonian, it's a truth-telling role. And it is increasingly dangerous to tell the truth to power. And it takes tremendous courage and will and intelligence to stand up to that. Um, the reason why I can stand up to my government now is because I see the data. I see the manipulation. I see how it's weakening democracy. Um, in 14 months, I've had 11 cases filed against Rappler. I've posted bail eight times. I've been arrested twice. Once, I mean, I was coming off of a plane March 29th, and I was going to go post bail, but they still wanted to arrest me. Um, and then they pushed me into a van where there were four officers in full SWAT gear and three other police officers fully armed. And I thought, it, it's a crime to be a journalist. I must be treated like a terrorist instead, right? This is the world we live in today. Not as bad in the United States, but who knows, right? Um, when President Trump called the New York Times and CNN fake news, a week later, that video that you saw, President Duterte called Rappler fake news. So what you guys do here in the States definitely has an impact. Why should you become a journalist? Because we need good, smart, courageous people to, here's the exciting part. Whatever you do today will create what journalism will become. And journalists are important because without the facts, you cannot have democracy. That's the biggest problem we have right now. So um, we'll take your question in a moment. I just want to ask you one other thing. It is very sobering to see that data um, and you know, uh, you made a point of saying, you know, we still have institutions in the United States, but it seems that some of the institutions that have affected you the most, both in terms of giving you a platform in the first place, but then providing others these means to attack you, are also things that were invented in the United States, namely social media. So, um, where how are you feeling right now about progress in society's appreciation for this or the specific steps that people like Mark Zuckerberg are uh, you know, clearly under pressure starting to talk more about? Um, do, you, do you think where, which direction is the trend line going? And, and I think more important for everyone here, you know, what, would you, what are concrete things that you really want to see done and what should um, I assume, is there anybody in this room who is not on social media? See? Um, oh my gosh, and, you have to see that. Yeah. Yeah. They're all on social media. Okay. You're all on social <laughs> media. Um, how many of you would describe yourself as somebody who gets your news 
at least, I don't know, half of the time via social media. Okay. And um, primarily Facebook, raise your hand. Primarily Twitter. Wow. Okay. And uh, something other than Twitter or Facebook that's, that's a platform? What, what, what platform? Instagram. Okay. Ah. Okay. I should have, should have asked. What's up? What's up? Okay. China is also decent. So against that backdrop, what 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 needs to happen, uh, given those very sobering uh, data visualizations that you showed us? Ah, what needs to happen? So I think first, I think it's ironic that American tech companies are the ones that with these values, right? Liberal values for liberal democracy uh, are the ones that are actually killing democracy in other parts of the world. Um, it's violent in the global south. And when Mark Zuckerberg was in front of Congress in 2018, for us, we'd already lived through two and a half years of, of stuff, nearly at that point, two years, right? I survived it, we'd survived it, because this is a new weapon that's used against journalists and a lot more against women. Um, what needs to be done? So the first, and I think they're doing it, uh, Rappler is one of the fact-checking partners of Facebook in the Philippines. And we fact-check not so much for you know, each story, whether each story is real, because that's like whack-a-mole, right? They just keep popping up because it's exponential and it's cheap. Um, but what we do is once we fact-check a story, we can then look at the network that spreads the lie, right? So the larger the circle, the larger the eigenvector centrality, meaning the more powerful the account is. So we can chart the networks. Um, my background with CNN was charting terrorist networks. Um, that was what I spent a lot of my career doing in Southeast Asia. So this is another form of terrorist networks. I think one of the things that need to happen is Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, the social media platforms have to take the data and be far more transparent. Put it in a place where we can correlate the terrorist networks, right? And there have to be consequences when you're found to be doing information operations. Um, you're sorting this out in the United States now with the Internet Research Agency, the Russian accounts that have actually I've seen academic research which says, uh, no, they didn't really affect the vote, right? These information operations didn't affect the vote. You're missing the point when you say that. It's not about convincing you to vote for one or the other. It is about convincing you that this country doesn't work, right? So what they've done is to actually pound the fracture lines of society, pound lines of identity, Black Lives Matter, they're on both sides of that debate, right? Uh, measles, the outbreak of measles that's happening globally. Internet Research Agency was involved in some of that, right? Convincing people not to get vaccinations. This is information operations that weakens you at a fundamental, personal level that has scale. So. Anyway, I'll shut up about this. I think that you know there has to be kind of like a global Interpol, right? We need to run after these people. And I'm seeing this is creative destruction that's happening now, right? I am seeing Facebook. Facebook has done three takedowns in the Philippines. One of the takedowns, the largest one in January this year, was for a network we identified 13 months earlier. Imagine the, dis the destruction that could have been avoided, right? Um, this is not a good time to be on social media or to be a journalist. It's dangerous, it's difficult, it manipulates you. Television in the past was seen as manipulative, but nothing matches social media. When you're on social media, your brain is literally being rewired. Your hormones are being shifted. Dopamine, if you're familiar with a dopamine high, right? It's mildly addictive. And that kicks in when you're on social media. And the technologists, the engineers who built it, have 
have actually optimized to manipulate us so we spend the most time on site. So all of these things need to shift because it's bad for democracy. But we'll see how fast they do it. All right, let's, let's get you yeah. down in front. Hi, Maria. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Paul Nadal. I'm a new faculty member in the English Department and American Studies here. And so what I really appreciate about your presentation, I was really intrigued by the uh, images of the social network analysis that you, you shared with us. And it reminded me, actually, of the sort of Kino diaspora, right? And to me, like, I feel like Kino diaspora, is, as you know, is large and extensive. So my question has to do with, you know, um, what role has a Filipino, a Filipino overseas, um, Balikbayans, Filipino Americans, but also Filipinos in the Middle East and Asia, in this fight, um, you know, for truth that Rappler is engaged in? And, whether or not you've seen a shift in kind of the involvement of Filipinos overseas, like, you know, during the Duterte regime compared to, say, previous administrations like Aquino or Arroyo? So the easy part of the question is the last part, the engagement of Filipinos in general have increased. Right? That's what social media has done because we were able, the overseas, the way the Duterte campaign ran it is they broke down four different groups by island, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, and overseas Filipino workers. And then they had a central messaging group that would tell each of these networks um, what's the message of the day, right? Overseas Filipino workers were great supporters of President Duterte. Not your demographic class, though, here. Um, so it's still uh, the Middle East. Saudi Arabia has a million Filipino workers, so roughly 10 to 12 million Filipinos living overseas. Um, there is a small diaspora that is already starting to stand up against the human rights violations that's happening. It's pushing for press freedom. Um, group in Stanford uh, started something, uh, strengthened a group called the Malaya Movement. Malaya means free. Um, they were just in DC lobbying. And again, these are things, you know, it's strange as a journalist to think that we would lobby for something, but uh, I don't, I speak from my experience now that I know how power has been abused. There is no way that I sh these cases should have proceeded as far as they've gone, um, especially since Imelda Marcos, who's been convicted on many cases, has paid less bail than I have and has never been arrested. I mean, really, <laughs> sorry. So um, what role can they play? A lot more uh, because you're not afraid here, right? In the Philippines, this isn't for you either. Um, in the Philippines, we now have to deal with increased security for Rappler. I have to deal with increased security. Walking around Princeton without security is incredible. It's so liberating. Um, so the oppressiveness is starting, it's, it's palpable. And there will only be a few months where we can fight to, to preserve our constitution because we have elections May 13th. And if we lose an independent Senate, that will mean that we could pass a new constitution. And so by the end of the year, if the Philippines has a new constitution, we won't be a democracy anymore, which actually will make it easier for me because then I don't have to fight anymore. <laughs> Yeah, it's a fantastic question, and the answer is TBD. Um, <laughs> uh, here's what I'm focusing on, right? Uh, we're focusing on doing investigative journalism because all of this is meant to distract us and take away our resources from investigative journalism. So uh, in the last week, um, P the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism and Rappler, we published stories that looked at the Duterte wealth. Uh, President Duterte, in response, attacked. Um, and at one point, there is a series that also looked at the relationship to drug syndicates of the Duterte family. He threatened, President Duterte, in response to that, threatened to take away the writ of habeas corpus and to declare a revolutionary government. How do you handle that? I mean, um, 
So for me, I've moved away. Part of it is, I think, if I lose that segment of the audience now, truth has a long gestation period and lifeline. I feel like what we need to do is to constantly call it out. Every, the reason I keep coming home and keep getting arrested, the reason I keep coming home is because we, they need to be actions. And these actions define further descent of our democracy into a more authoritarian style rule, right? These actions carry names of people. And history, as long as we're on the right side of history, there will be a reckoning and these names will pop up again. I hope your generation does a better job than my generation in terms of holding these, those who abuse, those who act with impunity, holding them to account. But the record is clear. So the quick answer is I can't fight for them now. We just have to do what we do, right? It's not micro-targeting. And I will lose them for a period of time, but I have great faith that in the end, we're on the right side of history. Invitation over here. Thank you. I wanted to just ask you a little bit more of your thoughts on the impact of technology. You mentioned Facebook. Uh, I also know, I think like Google has so much power over us in the future in terms of how we perceive and receive truth. You know, most people search something and they click on the top five things, something like that, and other people have both decentralized technology, fact checking. Um, they think that would really change the landscape. So, uh, have you been in any sort of discussion in terms of how we can use technology in the future, how it will impact things? And also, just a quick question is if you have the superpower uh, to click a button and shut down Facebook, would you do that? Uh, do you think social media has done more harm to our society fundamentally than, than good? That's a great question. Um, remember, Rappler couldn't exist without social media. So, I know the upside. Uh, we grew 100 to 300 percent year on year our first four years. And we did that with social media. And we used social media for social good. I drank the Kool Aid. We built communities of action with Facebook. We used it for disaster risk reduction. We helped people with it, right? So, no, I wouldn't throw it out. But I would, as I am doing now, I'm demanding clear, concrete, actions from social media. And I, I think these platforms understand that because they're not stupid. Um, these, they call them unintended consequences. You know, every day they don't change means that someone in the global south dies. The consequences in my countries, in the countries outside the United States, uh, it's life and death. You know, so for me, despite that, this kind of time period is, is horrendous, but I'm not gonna throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I think that this is, if you're an engineering student, if you're a humanities student, part of the problem is that the engineers went and built something without the mission, right? I mean, this is what you're gonna learn from Princeton, how to think it out, how to create a better world. There is a, a purpose for it, I hope, or maybe I'm too idealistic, but I, I felt it. So I'm working with them to actively try to clean it up and to, to bring it back to where it is a force for good. And for Google and the decentralized technology, what are your thoughts on the other? We work very closely with Google, Twitter, with Facebook, and um, I think Google got it right when they did the page search, the rankings, right? But it's, as you can see, the methodology we use is not content. That's why Americans sometimes get lost in the, is it truth, it isn't, is it not? Is it free speech? Are you stifling free speech? It's not about the content. It's about the network that spreads disinformation. You peg that. That's what I was proposing. Um, and in the end, all of these, because now the stuff on Facebook, they're all on YouTube, right? And the video that's there is propaganda as well. It's meant to manipulate you. So they actually need to work together far more closely. But part of the reason they can't is because the kind of environment we've created, they can't move without serious repercussions. At the same time, enlightened self-interest, if they don't move, there will be serious repercussions, right? They're also caught in a catch-22. But here's what I'm seeing, right? Uh, if you look at the data of what Facebook has taken down in the last year, 
let's just say, 2018 until today. They hired a guy named Nathaniel Gleitscher in January 2018. He used to head cybersecurity for the Obama White House. Every announcement of a takedown on Facebook is by him. And you can kind of see how they are taking the same idea um, and looking at networks and pulling them down. That leads to the next step. If you're pulling down networks, will you allow lies to stay in place, right? They all took Alex Jones down. Why did it take so long? And what will they do for the Alex Jones that are percolating in countries like the Philippines? These are questions that I have. I'm talking about long-term future. Long-term future is that um, it's kind of the same way that the gatekeeping powers of journalists evolved over time, right? And then we evolved our standards and ethics manual. I think technologists are going to have to figure out what are the underlying principles and values that they're building for. I suggest the sustainable development goals, for one. That would be a positive, right? Uh, but if you look at it, they've atomized everything, which is the way tech looks at everything. Content moderation is atomized. Uh, and that's part of the reason why you have, you know, it was a Filipino who took down the napalm girl. You know which one I'm talking about? The Vietnamese, this iconic Vietnamese photo of the girl who was naked running away from the napalm. That was taken down by a content moderator in the Philippines because there's a tick naked, right? You cannot. You can't take the world. The technologist approach uh, needs to be complemented by the humanist approach. Well, f Facebook ad technology, right? Right. I, mean, you may, I don't know if you followed, but you know, basically, there's been redlining in Facebook ads. People were able to exclude or include certain groups for real estate ads. So you could you could post a real estate ad and have it seen by a you know, biased audience. No, no one made Facebook. I mean, all, all it took was somebody in a meeting or a job to say that that's not something we should allow. It's right. something we can, we have the technology for, right. but, but this is wrong. Right. But that doesn't seem to happen that much among, as you say, it's, it's so atomized and, and so dispersed within, within the company. I think they're just starting to figure, the, they're just starting to hire the right people with the skills to look at impact, um, if that makes sense. Because again, think about, so the, the perfect one is Nathaniel and this team of investigators who are doing a law enforcement issue. Like, think about them like the Department of Justice. There's another group that's like the CIA, right? Another group like the FBI. These are all different parts. I mean. Facebook puts together 2.5 billion accounts globally. Part of the reason a lie spread so fast now is precisely because there are no boundaries of nation states. So that's part of what they need to include into the equation when they think about it. And I don't think that the end, sorry, not against any engineer, but that's part of the problem is that the engineers will take it out and they've optimized to keep you on site. Sorry, I don't mean to hijack this conversation at all. But, so, but, but, but then if you're doing content moderation, you're letting Facebook take those networks out, they become the moral arbitrator, right? They, they already so, are. They yeah, built right? it. So, so, so how, how do they determine those things? What if, what if Facebook becomes evil and starts taking down your site? You as the enemy of the people, and then, then it gets out of control, right? So, so shouldn't it be a free platform then? Why, why should those, those tech companies play the role of moral arbitrator? Because they created it, number one. Number two, regardless of whatever laws, because I think what you're saying is maybe this should be governments legislating, and they're starting to legislate. And you know what? Government legislators don't understand the technology, and they're actually going to kill part of the potential that is there. Number three, regardless of how we engage with Facebook, they're already doing it. Google has already done it. Twitter has already done it, right? We have no choice. Now, your choice is you can choose not to be part of it, but what are the consequences for doing that? Actually, I would suggest at your age that 
it may not be bad not to be on social media um, because so much of identity forming happens at this point in time. Wait, can, can I ask you guys? I mean, I know Facebook is used in a lot of organizations and maybe even you know some, some campus activities for scheduling or whatever. Would, if, if you think you could just delete your Facebook account without it affecting your life here as a student um, without any problems, raise, raise your hand. Okay. So not, but but not necessarily everyone. Ben, how are we doing for time? We have uh, one more, perhaps. I know that I don't want to ignore anyone, but there was another question. Uh, but probably one more. Great. Let's. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm. Uh, Sarah, <laughs> nice to meet you in person. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm a neuroscience PhD student, so a lot of these graphs and I can vectors. I'm also a member uh, and organizer with the International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines. Fantastic. It's really interesting that you brought up the Malaya movement, which is a movement that we collaborate pretty closely with. I just came from DC actually doing some of those lobby visits. Ah, I want to hear. Um, and yeah, and over the week, weekend, over 350 people um, showed up to DC. Uh, Filipinos and non Filipinos alike, our allies, and those who are just interested and concerned about where our US tax, tax dollars go to. Um, convened to basically like call out the human rights violations in the Philippines. And for organizations and alliances like ICHER um, and also Malaya Movement, we kind of see this issue um, as part of a larger human rights issue right, in the right. Philippines. Um, and also escalating fascism in the Philippines that also has in, is influenced by what's happening in the US, like what you had already alluded to. And so, so folks like us, like folks in that movement, types of movements are actually like we, we definitely feel like when you said like what is rap learning? it is the fuel for the action of communities and that is what I like really want to rewind to and kind of um, allude back to Dr. Nadal's point earlier about what Filipinos can do um, and so when we were lobbying um, we had we had three demands basically for different Congress people and different senators um, and I think one of the most relevant ones is um, uh, the House Resolution 233 and Senate Resolution 142. Yes, um, bipartisan. Calling, yes, calling on the government of the Philippines to release political prisoner Senator Leila de Lima and allow human rights offenders, such as you, is what we would consider you, um, to operate without fear of reprisal. Um, and of course, there's three other demands, um, all of which amount to about $184.5 million. And these are taxes uh, that like we uh, pay for. Um, and this is um, really ridiculous, I guess. Uh, not I guess, but I know. <laughs> and so I guess my question for you, um, also a fun fact, um, Maria was also the keynote speaker through video message of the summit this, this, uh, this weekend. And so thank you so much for those inspiring words. Um, and so my question for you is basically, how do you think uh, Princeton particularly, and maybe we can expand that to other influential schools like other Ivy Leagues, um, can be involved in the people's movement to support Filipinos, whether you're Filipino or not, um, in the attacks on human rights. I mean, first, thank you. Thank you for going to DC, and I'm happy to meet you finally. Uh, when I was a student in Makash, it was a petition against apartheid. That's how long ago it was. Um, your battle is the battle for truth. It is, truth is connected with human rights, with the growth of authoritarian populist dictators. Sorry, it's of a, it's of a type, right? The Putinesque uh, information operations that, I, I think of Russia as B to C and China as B to B. You know what I mean by B to B? China just signed a deal with the Philippine government uh, doing video surveillance giving video surveillance equipment to the Philippines. Human rights, the right to freedom of expression, freedom of the press, these, the Bill of Rights, um, the Philippine Constitution is patterned after the US Constitution. These are under threat. And so, again, why does it matter to you? Because this battle is already at your borders, it's inside your country. I think we were a test case. We're the canary in the coal mine. Um, and we're a test case because, <laughs> I hate to say, the Philippines was a former colony of the United States, uh, 100 million people who speak English. Almost every new product rolled out 
is first rolled out in the Philippines before it moves to English-speaking countries. Yahoo used to do this. The other, um, the other tech platforms do the same thing. So the fight for human rights, this is at the, at the core, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, these are at the core of, of liberal democracies. Um, this is, I think, critical to your future. So you have the intellect, the time, and um, I hope the idealism to fight this. Um, and I have to say thank you for the prince, the prince and, uh, and the journalists who, Kathy Keeley and, and the other hundred former prince, hundred journalists and former journalists, including Mike McCurry, we still take him as a journalist, um, uh, who were Princeton graduates who came out with statements. Our survival, my survival in the Philippines is all dependent on, um, on how we shine the light. And that's driven by you. So I felt it. That's the reason I came here. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, thank you because um, this helps our battle. Thank you for going to DC. You know, it's, uh, I wasn't an activist when I was here in Princeton. Um, but this is a weird world right now. You're creating the world. So um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you.